Welcome everyone. In the episode number 2, we've learned what money is. We've had grasped it shortly through its formal definition but mostly through its three main functions. Good if you've watched the episode number 2. You'll still survive in case you haven't. Today, we'll see how and what the money was invented for. For that, I'll tell you a little story. Imagine an island with only two living souls, Barry and Anna. Barricade has good hunting skills, helpful when it comes to catching seagulls. He's also good at finding potable water thanks to his ability to crack coconuts like nobody. Turning to Anagram, she's pretty good with sticks. She can build shelters and make spears that Barry would use for hunting seagulls. Both need each other as much to feed themselves and to survive. To make our exercise simple, we'll consider that, when they deal and trade with each other, the overall value of their work is equivalent at end of each year. In this case, they simply need to agree on values for their products so that their exchanges can be regular and acceptable by both. They would then agree on some kind of conversion table, to determine and know how much one thing is worth in another. By the way, you've understood, this is simply the principle of barter. The main problem in a barter economy is the need for double coincidence of wants. Back to Anna and Barry, they would keep records of those transactions to know who owes what. With only two persons, each having only two types of goods to offer, the table's already repelling. How ugly would it look with a hundred persons having as many types of goods to offer? Yep. Not very practical. To make life easier in their exchanges, Anna and Barry create a money they decided to call the shell. Guess what they chose to materialize their money? Shells. My imagination wasn't that prolific at this point. Now, they only need to exchange shells and it becomes greatly simpler. For a start, they agree to share 100 shells each. From that time, the shells are circulating from one to the other. This allows them to give a value of conversion to everything. They end up agreeing on something. A shelter is valued 20 shells, a harpoon 10 shells, a seagull 4 shells and an open coconut 2 shells. In such case, they would no longer need to keep records of those exchanges. Remember. For simplicity, we'll consider that the total value of the work Barry and Anna have produced and traded with each other at end of each year is equivalent. So, at end of each year, each one of them has 100 shells, because Barry bought 3 shelters for 60 shells and 4 harpoons for 40 shells. But at the same time, he sold to Anna 10 seagulls for 40 shells and 30 coconuts for 60 shells. So that's it. A money that works perfectly. Thank you folks. See ya. Eeeh. Almost. I did not mention it, but you could sense that there's something crucial with this system of shells. You understood that this whole system is based on trust. If one of our two participant characters discreetly introduces extra shells, then the other one gets robbed. If trust disappears and one of them no longer accepts shells then the system collapses instantly and it is the one who has the most shells in hands that gets robbed by the other. Isn't it the same for our actual currencies? Exactly, and precisely the same. That's why it's called fiat currency. Having value only because the government declares so and mint it out of any valuable commodity, such as gold or silver. Now let's add a layer of complexity to our story. Let's consider that after one year, Anna and Barry become more efficient in their work and they start producing twice as much. They then take advantage of it to increase their lifestyle by also consuming twice as much. At the current price, Barry and Anna no longer have enough shells to exchange their productions. Yet, they still have things to trade. So there in fact they end up with a problem that is purely monetary. Does it mean that when we're told money's going to be created in order to create growth, someone's actually going to get scammed? Eeh, yep. Anyway, we also understood another thing, that productivity is defined as the quantity of things produced over the same amount of time. In our illustration, the second year, each of our two friends produces twice as much. 
In such case, we say that the annual productivity has doubled. Back to our monetary problem, our two friends will then have only two options. Option 1, they keep the same money supply being exchanged between them, and in such case, they simply divide all the prices by two. Considering that everything costs half as much, Anna and Barry have again, enough money to continue to exchange their increased production. Option 2, they use two times more shells to find a balance between the new number of things produced and the new amount of money in circulation. Let's look together at option 1, where Anna and Barry simply divide all prices by two while the quantity of the shells in circulation does not change. Few things to understand in this case. First, when productivity increases, prices should fall if we do not touch the money supply. In our modern world, productivity is constantly increasing. That's why we say that capitalism is by nature deflationary. Agriculture is a very obvious example. In the 19th century a farmer could feed three persons with his work. Today a farmer feeds about a hundred persons. In such case, productivity has been multiplied by 30. In our example when we divide the prices by two, the shell has appreciated. Its value has increased, considering that from the second year, each shell buys twice as much things as the previous year. Secondly you also need to retain that when the value of a money increases, it means that the prices go down. We say in such case that the money appreciates. Thirdly, a deflationary economy rewards savings. The more the money appreciates, the more its purchasing power increases. So even if I simply stack my money, my purchasing power will increase. In this case, no need for banks or investment to yield a profit. Hold on, you said you would explain how money works. You first say that prices should go down as technology advances, when in reality everyone knows that prices keep going up. Then, you mention the deflation as something nice, whereas all politics and the economists want to fight it. E. Yes, true. That's because currently our economy is not working as it should. But we'll come back on that. Let's look at option two. Scenario where the prices don't change but where we double the number of shells, right? Yes. In this case, if Anna makes an effort to save some of her shells the previous year, she does not benefit from the increase in productivity, since the prices do not move. Assuming that she saved two shells, she would still buy one coconut from one year to the next. Worse. Both, Anna and Barry will have 100 new shells. That means that both will benefit in the same way from productivity gains, regardless of their savings. In other words, whether they've been spenders or savers, they'll be treated the same way. On the other hand, not everything is negative in this scenario, given that prices do remain stable. Okay, but the prices still do not increase. Again, true. But at the same time, if I could explain everything about creation of money in less than 10 minutes, then I would be telling you a lot of stupidities. What to take out at this point? In a world where quantity of wealth produced increases, if the quantity of money remains the same, then the prices fall. And when the prices fall, that's called a deflation. If we don't want the prices to fall, then we must create additional quantity of money, increase the money supply, up to a level matching the surplus of production or wealth, and in this case, the system is neutral. No inflation or deflation. And now to answer your question on inflation and how prices go up, I will introduce a new character to our story, the king. Meet Bulios. One day, Bulios arrives to the island. He notices that Anna and Barry work well and produce more than they need. However he considers that they are not very well organized and addresses to them the following speech. Hello. It's nice here. But we will do better. We? We? Who exactly are you talking to? Because everything is going very well here. I don't think so. No, you really need someone to protect you from strangers. And by the way, who guarantees each of you that the other doesn't cheat on your accounts? 
you need someone to control your currency and guarantee its value. Also, if there's a disagreement between you two, you need to have someone to judge the problem impartially. So, from now on, I'm the king and I'll take care of it all, you lucky fellas. Questions? Oh no sir, you must have been misinformed, everything is fine here, we need nothing. Hmm, I see. Yeah, well, it doesn't matter. We're gonna do it as I said anyway. Complains? But kicking, and bone smashing. I guess now, we all agree. From that moment, Bulios has become king and his job will be the three governing and sovereign functions, security, money, and justice. And from that day, everything goes back to how it was before. Anna makes harpoons and shelters while Barry supplies open coconuts and seagulls. As for Bulios, he controls the money, renders justice, and he is ready to break some collarbones in case of conflict. As king, first decision of Bulios is to levy a tax, so that Anna and Barry can remunerate his precious services. And remember, we said earlier in this video that there were 200 shells circulating in the economy of our island. Each year, Bulios will therefore collect 35 tax shells from Anna and 35 tax shells from Barry. Thus, everyone has the same thing. Or, almost. Bulios will get 70 shells while Anna and Barry will have 65 shells each. But let's admit that it's fine for them. Promptly after, Bulios decides that, as king, to guarantee the value of a shell, he will engrave those shells with his head on it and that it will be called a bully euro. The bully euros will replace the shells. So, there's no longer any doubt about the value of the money in circulation, since it's guaranteed by Bulios. And if someone were to make a counterfeit, then it will be up to Bulios to remind him about the butt kicking and bones smashing rule. Hey, this story is horrible, it turns into a nightmare in real life. Everyone knows that a government is good for something, it's not that caricatural all the same. Of course, I'm simplifying and exaggerating for pedagogy purpose but also because I enjoy adding a hint of theatricality and dramaturgy in my stories. But, there's a point. You should be wondering why governments don't always seem to fight the inflation. That's what we'll understand here. Because some governments, like mine, in France, do have an undeniable interest to have inflation. We'll understand why here. Bear with me. For a few years, everything's going well and Anna and Barry have learned leaving with Bulios around. Then an idea comes up in the enlightened mind of Bulios. Given that all bully euros pass through his hands, and that he's the only one having the right to produce them, he tells himself that if he manufactures one or two more bully euros for him from time to time, no one would see it. And anyway, if someone does notice, that someone would have to come and explain his or her point of view to Bulios. So, each year, he produces one or two extra bully euros that he keeps for himself or spends. However, since, over time, there are more and more bully euros in circulation, for the same quantity of things produced, Anna and Barry decide to increase their prices little by little to prevent Bulios from being able to buy all their goods. And in return Bulios raises the taxes, because the cost of living has gone up. Moral of the story, Bulios monopolizes wealth by increasing his purchasing power compared to Anna and Barry. So yes, Anna and Barry do increase their prices. However, that's only in a second phase. That's why it's indeed a theft from Bulios. In the end the money gradually loses its value, as the same quantity of bully euros buys less and less things. This inflationary mechanism is called money printing. More academically, the inflation induced by an excess of money supply. When this logic's pushed to the end, prices increase more and more quickly until confidence is definitively destroyed. At such stage, everyone's looking for a substitute, like barter or gold. In fact, Inflation has other causes linked to the functioning of the economy, and we can mention them quickly. 1. Inflation induced by the demand. When there's not enough of something for everyone, 
sellers raise their prices to take advantage. That's the basic law of offer and demand in economics. 2. The imported inflation. That's about the repercussion of the prices of the raw materials on the selling price. For instance, if the oil price increases, everything increases. 3. The inflation induced by costs. Basically same principle as the imported inflation, though it's internally this time. For instance, in cases where wages increase, the selling prices will also increase. 4. Inflation mechanism of market control, such as agreements between competitors in the same sector or by prices administered by the state. In conclusion, as much as the four types of inflation that we've just seen last are linked to economic life, as much as using the money printers directly translates the desire of a government for enrichment, without offering compensation. It's indeed a sort of scam or theft, taking the form of destruction of the value of the money. In the next video, we'll see why some governments recourse to the money printing race in an attempt to reduce the burden of their debts. If you liked the video, subscribe and share it to help developing this channel.